truth. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth. Rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Hayes. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph, it is Catholic Family Men Monday, where we primarily direct the content to men, most especially to those of us who are called to the vocation of marriage and family, in order to build up husbands and fathers in Christ, to bless the family and sanctify the world. And everyone, though, is most certainly welcome to listen and or watch plenty here that is valuable and applicable to all. Our topic today is Living the Ten Commandments. Our guest today is Monsignor Charles Pope, who, who wrote a terrific book on the Ten Commandments, published in 2014 by TAN. You can get it by going to tanbooks.com or wherever you find uh, your favorite Catholic books. Um, but um, Monsignor Pope is also pastor of Holy Comforter, St. Cyprian Catholic Church in Washington, D.C. He's also very generous in proclaiming the truth in his spare time via Catholic media and by giving various lectures across the U.S. For more on his good work, go to msgrpope.com, monsignorpope.com. Monsignor Pope, it's a blessing to have you back with us. Thank you for, for being here with us once again. How are you today? Good, thank you. I, it's great to be here. Feeling, feeling good. All right, wonderful. Can you lead us in an opening prayer? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, um, sometimes our... Um, our, our sinful nature rebels at being told what to do. It rebels at commands. But help us to appreciate more and more how your commands are for us a very precious gift. They're not prison walls, but rather defending walls. And that through them, um, you guard us from the incursions of the evil one. And you prepare us for glories, uh, joys unspeakable and glories untold. And so please then, Lord, help us to develop a great love and appreciation for your commands through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Monsignor Pope. We are going to open the phone lines in just a little bit, hoping for some uh, interaction here today. So be ready for that. Any questions, comments, if you'd like to get in on this show, ask a question to Monsignor Pope on the Ten Commandments, which we are going to be speaking about today, specifically his book, the Ten Commandments. Uh, we will be opening those phone lines in a little bit. Um, but first, uh, Monsignor Pope, can you begin by way of introduction? Um, well, we'll bring him in in just a moment um, to help us. He's going to yes. help us to walk through the introduction, and then we'll go from there. And I think we, we've got him with us. So, Monsignor Pope, by way of introduction, um, what would you like to say off the top? You wrote a great introduction in the book, but any themes we should keep in mind as we dig into this today? Yeah, we you know, as I said uh, during the, the opening prayer, I think that um, we want to be careful that to see the commandments as a, a gift of God, and, and before they're a prescription, they're actually a description, namely of the transformed human person. So the transformed human person, they love, they love God. And uh, the transformed human person in every way seeks to, um, um, you know, to, to keep holding the Sabbath, looks forward to worshiping God. The transformed human uh, person, um, they respect, they revere their parents and their family. The transformed human person, in every way, they, they, they respect the lives of other people around them. And they have authority over their sexuality. And um, they, um, you know, again, they, 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 they don't steal. <laughs> they don't take what doesn't belong to them. Uh, they don't bear false witness. And uh, they, their, their greed has been, and covetousness is moderated by virtue. So it's, it's a description that this is the life, says the Lord, that I'm offering you. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is to see that the commandments are not just... Um, Prison walls are not prison walls, but rather they're, they're defending walls. Every ancient city had walls around it. Um, and inside the walls, you're under a lot of protection. Outside the walls, all bets are off. You know, and, uh, the, the walls do impose limits, but they're salutary. They're helpful. They're good limits for us. And we get into all kinds of trouble to the degree that, you know, we, um, we don't attend to them. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah, there, there certainly is a freedom in living the, the commandments. These are certainly, as you said, gifts of God to us. They are blessings to us, and so we ought to see them that way. Also, in the, in the introduction, you make it clear that, that that each commandment, each of these words of the Decalogue, they they may be and they do mean more than what. Uh, most of us might think that they mean. Jesus really digs into them a couple times in the Gospels and says, hold on, you think it means this, but it actually means much more. Uh, speak to us about that a little bit. Yeah, we have a tendency to be minimalist, you know. Um, just a humorous example of that. I, When I was a, a youngster, um, you know, maybe a young teenager, I, I said, well, I can't break the Sixth Commandment. I'm not married. and I'm, I'd never be with a married woman because they're all old. So anyway, I didn't think I could break the Sixth Commandment, but of course, our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount especially, he says, look, um, what exceeding are you doing? You know, so you've heard the commandment, he said, not to commit adultery, but I say it to you, anyone who even looks at lust at another person has already committed adultery in their thoughts. Or likewise, um, in his treatment of the commandment not to kill, not to murder, he says that, uh, look, he says, you've heard the commandment not to kill, but I say to you, whoever... Um, you know, whoever says to his brother Raka or you fool um, it already risks the fires of, Ge- of Gehenna, of hell. Why? Well, because, you know, people don't just get up and kill one morning. I mean, it's very rare. <laughs> but but they, there's usually a whole lot of stuff that leads up to hatred, revenge, retribution, um, you know, just this 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 animus we hold against certain people or groups and with that that stuff just people you may not have killed anybody yet but they might as well be dead for all you care and so the lord is saying i'm I'm looking for something deeper in these commandments it isn't just okay you haven't broken the commandment not to kill today good for you you didn't kill anybody but really what's going on in your heart you know how do you revere other human beings how do you treat them and respect their life um so these these are things I think that we we often you know we tend to become minimalist, um, always trying to show kind of like uh, teenagers you know being very very um, uh, a very very narrow reading of the commandments. So like I remember one time I was teaching a bunch of seventh graders uh, and uh, and I said to them now look do your work quietly no no talking, and then one young lady starts to sing. <laughs> And of course, I said, Car- Carmen, if it's interesting, her name was Carmen, which in Latin means song. I said, Carmen, I told you, don't, no talk. She said, I wasn't talking, I was singing. <laughs> and so the idea is that we know that very often, if you just take a very narrow interpretation of things, that you're missing the point. And uh, the Lord, obviously, in these 10 words or these 10 commandments, it says something, but they are to be interpreted expansively and deeply and richly uh, as a guide for life. So we really run the risk of becoming minimalist uh, if we uh, always try to show how they don't apply and have a very narrow interpretation. And we're missing God's point. It isn't just don't murder. It's love and respect the life of every human person and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And as you write at the end of the introduction towards the end, we will look at the fuller and inner inner meaning of each commandment and see the freedom and truth to which each command points. So that's what um, listeners, those in the audience, those watching, you have an opportunity uh, to hear that as Monsignor breaks these things open as we go through the commandments, both in this show today and also next Monday. But let's open up the phone lines right now. It's your opportunity to call in any question or comment you might have on this topic for Monsignor Charles Pope, one 511 5483 That's one 511 Five four eight three, Monsignor Pope. Anything to share in terms of this layer of uh, of what this show is directed towards? Specifically, what we try to direct this Monday show towards, which is the Catholic family man, the, the husband and father. Um, anything specific from just thinking about your book, the Ten Commandments, and thinking about how maybe a husband and, and a father might be viewing it. Is there anything unique to which you'd like to speak to there? Yeah, I, I do think that one of the things that um, we've unfortunately seen in our culture in the last uh, 30 to 40 years is passive fathers, passive husbands, 
sort of passive, disconnected men. Scripture puts a very important place for the Father in teaching children the faith. Uh, Ephesians 6, for example, it says, uh, you know, fathers, teach your children uh, the faith. And so this idea is, in most families, this is consigned to the mother. And if the father goes to church at all, he has to be dragged there. Um, Seldom does he pray with them. Seldom is he seen as a man of prayer. Seldom um, does he really lead the the family, if you will, spiritually. Now, I pray that many who are listening are exceptions, but this is too often the case. So I think that uh, particularly in terms of the commandments, that there's a special role. My, my father did have a very special role, not always in teaching religiously me, but by gosh, right and wrong, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to hear from dad about those things. And I think that um, to take that and apply it in a more spiritual way would be to say, I think that we have to get to a place where we can, um, as men, do a much better job of of witnessing, first of all, that we strive to keep the commandments, that we're under God's authority, and that we have a reverence, a a holy fear, a respect for God, um, that we hold God in awe, and we want to prove Him. And then from there on, uh, men need to uh, also be able to, um, you know, then speak and and enunciate these teachings and insist upon them uh, with with their children from the old Shema prayer. Mm-hmm. Yes, very good. So yeah, a lot here of value for you men, husbands and fathers, especially grandfathers as well. But for everybody who is listening, watching today, or whenever you come across this, perhaps in the future, we are going to dive into the first commandment as soon as we get back. But the phone lines are open for those that are watching or listening live today. It's your opportunity to become a part of the program with a question or a comment for Monsignor Pope on this. one 877 5115483 that's 18775115483 we'll be right back on the simple truth stay tuned prayer to saint michael o glorious prince of the heavenly host saint michael the archangel defend us in the battle and in the fearful warfare that we are waging against the principalities and powers against the rulers of this world of darkness, against the evil spirits. Come thou to the assistance of men whom Almighty God created immortal, making them in his own image and likeness and redeeming them at a great price from the tyranny of Satan. Fight this day the battle of the Lord with thy legions of holy angels, even as of old thou did fight against Lucifer, the leader of the proud spirits, and all his rebel angels who were powerless to stand against thee. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that apostate angel transformed into an angel of darkness, who still creeps about the earth to encompass our ruin, was cast headlong into the abyss together with his followers. But behold, that first enemy of mankind, and a murderer from the beginning, has regained his confidence, changing himself into an angel of light. He goes about with the whole multitude of the wicked spirits to invade the earth and blot out the name of God and his Christ to plunder, to slay, and to consign to eternal damnation the souls that have been destined for a crown of everlasting life. This wicked serpent, like an unclean torrent, pours into men of depraved minds and corrupt hearts the poison of his malice, the spirit of lying and piety and blasphemy, and the deadly breath of impurity, and every form of vice and iniquity. These crafty enemies of mankind have filled to overflowing with gall and wormwood the church, which is the bride of the Lamb, without spot. They have laid profane hands upon her most sacred treasures. Make haste, therefore, O invincible prince, to help the people of God against the inroads of the lost spirits, and grant us the victory. Amen. to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. We are talking about living the Ten Commandments with our guest today, Monsignor Charles Pope, who wrote a terrific book on the Ten Commandments, published in 2014 by Tan. Tanbooks.com is where you can pick that up. And you can learn more about Monsignor Pope and all of his good work by going to msgrpope.com. 
pope.com monsignorpope.com all right diving in to the first commandment here which um which is listed as follows i am the lord your god you shall not have strange gods before me and monsignor you write quote much more than a law against worshiping idols it is a summons to a whole way of life end of quote break this open for us the first commandment yeah it, it is a um uh, as you said, it's a whole way of life in that fundamentally, if you put it in the positive, I'm the Lord your God. Um, I want you to l- walk with me in trust. I want you to listen to what I say to you, and I want you to obey it out of love, but also, again, out of the fact that I'm, I'm the Lord. I know who you are. I know how you're made, and I know what's best for you. So we have a, a command, if you will, that we should walk with God and trust. Now, in a way, you go back to the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve are there, and God said, look, I, I, everything is yours. Uh, it's, it's all yours. Um, I ask you only one thing. Stay away from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, don't eat of that fruit, because the day you eat of it, you will surely, you know, you shall surely experience the power of, of suffering and death in your life. Now, God wanted, first of all, to trust him in this. But Satan says, you know, God's trying to take away some fun. You know, he wants, he wants to keep you down. He's, he wants to be the God, not you, but you be the gods. And you decide what you want to do. Now, listen to the, the I mean, but the idea for we should listen to this idea that the, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the word knowledge in biblical usage more often than not has much more of a meaning than just intellectual knowing but rather experiential knowing, um, sometimes even used as a euphemism for sexual, sexual intercourse, so that Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived uh, and bore a son. So there's obviously more than intellectual knowing there. So what, we, we, what God is saying, look, I don't want you to know, that is to say, I don't want you to experience evil. I want you to trust me to tell you what is good for you and what is not. I don't want you to have to experience the power of evil. So trust me in this, see? And, uh, and in effect, the devil asked Adam and Eve not to trust God. He uh, says, you be the God. I say, yeah, you, you, you say to him, I will decide what I want to do, and I will decide whether it's right or wrong. So you see, the idea is so much of our problems come when we don't really trust what God is saying, that you'll be happier um, if um, you, know, you follow my ways. Um, we get we get pretty uh, pretty nasty real fast when we're when someone talks to us like that if we're not careful. So this way of life then is a way of faith. It's a way of trust that God wants us to walk. Now, in in, in another sense, maybe I'll, I'll I can I can say more, much more, of course, to say about this commandment. But let me just get uh, whatever whatever feedback um, you or the listeners wants to give at this moment. Sure, yes, yeah, and phone lines are open, by the way, one 511 5483 If you want to get a question in, one 511 5483 But yeah, I want to make mention that in the back of the book, there is a terrific examination of conscience, uh, quite thorough, and, and I'm sort of looking at this examination of conscience as we go to say, what, what in particular are, are maybe the most popular things that maybe people are struggling with, particularly maybe husbands and fathers. And this one jumps out to me in terms of the first commandment. So maybe this will um, get you into a a good area here. But this is um, asking, did I have false gods in my life to which I gave greater attention than God, such as money, profession, drugs, TV, fame, pleasure, or property? Can you speak to us a little bit more about this? Yeah, you know, if you look at historically the Old um, Testament and the giving of this commandment, let's let's consider that, first of all, God was trying to protect them from false gods. Um, and these false gods, I mean, we should not make any, any, you know, try to clean it up or make it look pretty. A lot of these false gods um, brought real bewilderment and sorrow to the ancient people. St. Paul goes so far to say that when they thought they were worshiping these gods, they were actually worshiping demons. I mean, these demons required extensive sacrifices, even child sacrifice, you know, called for, permitted, and celebrated, you know, bizarre sexual practices. Um, There's all kinds of, you know, um, 
things that they did to really interrupt the life of, of the people and, and, and break through their families and um, just cause them all, all kinds of things, problems, you know, contradictory claims, demands, and all, all just all this bewilderment that was caused. Now, if you were to take that and put it into the modern setting where, you know, not everybody's worshiping a false god, although don't kid yourself. I mean, there are people out there, you know, worshiping rocks and stones today. Um, and uh, let's also be clear that, uh, you know, there are, there are people out there who kind of craft their own God. You know, they talk about the God I know, the God of my understanding. You know, we used to call this kind of stuff idolatry. So let's not kid ourselves. There's a lot of false worship going on and a lot of false gods out there. But it, to use it in the extended sense that you just did in the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 when you were reading from the examination of conscience, yeah, we've got a lot of other false things that sort of stand in the place of God for us, uh, where we, uh, we, you know, we just give all this attention and honor and respect to things of the world that are not God, you know, uh, money, profession, drugs, TV, fame. These things become like gods to us. Some people turn sex into a god. So, you know, th this is like their meaning. And some people um, um, also uh, get carried away with what I would say is almost a quasi-like worship of things like science or what have you, um, medicine. Um, of course, after this pandemic, I think some, some of the bloom is off that rose, you know, that doctors get things wrong too. And um, a lot of the advice we've been given hasn't been there, but it, these things can bring great harm to people. You know, when we, uh, we looked at TV stars or movie stars or basketball stars to be the star in our life, rather than to have the, to follow the true star that leads us to Jesus. Um, we, um, we, we, we cause harm. We bring harm. We get bad advice, uh, advice that's worldly. We get lost and confused if we think money's the way. Um, you know, the, the thing about greed is you just never have enough. It's a terrible affliction that most of us have, we just never have enough. And we need to, in some way, realize these things, these things, when we indulge them and turn them into gods, either literally as gods or more usually just, you know, kind of quasi-like quasi, quasi -like gods, um, we, 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 uh, we, we bring great harm and unhappiness on ourselves. So, yeah, that's, it's the idea. Remember, the commandments are one God wants to protect us. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and, and along those lines as well, uh, I think I have to get you in this direction to, to make clear uh, to folks as well who might be dabbling in, in this other stuff that is very, very harmful and included under the first commandment, which you talk about under this heading attempted control, but you point out how, you know, part of this is the, this consulting of horoscopes, palm reading, clairvoyance, recourse to mediums. Um, I also would love to get your comment on the what seems to be very popular, a very popular error in our time, which is this sort of melding of New Age beliefs and practices with Christianity, sort of um, believing and living a kind of syncretism, um, even though someone may be saying, Lord, Lord, um, when it comes to Jesus, they might be bringing in some Buddhism here or, you know, whatever else, some, uh, you know, self-help that goes um, too far in, into some of these areas as well. So anything to help us with this? Yeah, yeah, we'd be very, yeah, we should be very careful with uh, so many of these things that are going on in our culture. You know, we're, we're seeing a rise, of, well, we have been for a long time, of some of these new age movements and things that, that dabble in aspects of the occult, frankly. And I think we have to be very aware that I, I want to warn you, because, you know, having done some exorcism work myself over the years, I'm going to tell you, um, these open doorways to the demons and demonic world, they tend to answer when you call on them. And when you start dabbling in stuff, um, even if, if innocently at first, it's never a good idea. Um, we see even though today, again, just outright Satan worship is going on in increasing amounts. Um, this, you know, all these, all these turning to the occult, other things like that might seem less harmful to people like yoga and things, you know, um, all of these things open up the door to spiritual practices and approaches to God that are not revealed to us. Um, God is our father. We're to revere him, finding this sort of inner source of power within. This is not revealed to us. Um, what harm is there? It, it's harmful because it's not true. It's harmful because it can contradicts or uh, does not reflect what God has taught us. 
And this leads us astray. It, it, it substitutes other teachings and things uh, that, that God did not give us. And it's, it's foolish to play around with these possible, you know, inner energy sources and stuff, because again, demons love this kind of stuff because they can kind of worm their way in there and find openings and get access to us when we're not solidly behind the walls of God's teachings and commandments. So again, to all the fathers out there, especially warning, warning, find out what your kids are, you know, looking at the internet, not just the, the you know, the bad stuff like uh, violence or sexuality, but there's a lot of really bad uh, and confusing and, um, you know, things related to spirituality that, that are out there too. And I can tell you right now, it's not going to lead to any good place. At best, it will be relatively harmless if, if they don't go too deeply into it. But at worst, it can lead them pretty far astray. And we've had to spend a lot of time in exorcism ministry, you know, extracting people from this world of uh, sort of worldly, new age, quasi-Eastern things and, and so on. So I think enough said on that, but it's, it's, it, it is very serious and significant. God wants to protect us with this first commandment. That's always the key. He wants to protect us from this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that. And our phone lines are open. If you'd like to get a question in at this point, it's a great time to call 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. Monsignor, anything else that you want to add? I know that the final section in this part on the first commandment speaks about atheism and breaks that open some, and then you close with the positive in this chapter, just really mentioning how you you bring it back to how by this first commandment, uh, we cling to our God and entrust our whole self to him. Um, It really sets us up to make sure that we are um, living the other commandments well if we get this first one right. Um, But anything further you want to share with us? Yeah, it's called the first commandment for a reason, <laughs> and uh, it's it's uh, it does it opens the door to everything else because if, if I'm really trying to live this commandment, then the other things that God tells me are also going to make sense, and uh, I'm going to want to follow them. Uh, I, one other maybe area to talk about this in the book uh, is is the problem of atheism, which is an increasing problem today. Um, I think that atheism co- it comes in a couple of different forms. I, I think. The one type of atheism is where a person has had maybe tragedies or struggles in their life or their upbringing or other things hadn't, you know, just didn't really give them a real strong faith. And that's to be a concern. But we now have the rise of this rather militant atheism um, that that seeks to to crush the faith in other people, um, that seeks to exclude believers from the the, uh, town square, that seeks to in every way um, push back um, and ridicule God and the belief in God. Uh, I, this is kind of a militant atheism, and it's, it's becoming more and more of a problem because we don't go along with their way, you know. We're not just stupid or uh, not up to date. We're dangerous, and we've got to be eliminated. So I need to get a stop right now for the break, but I'll just say that, that this has been a, a new addition to the landscape in our time. Mm-hmm. Yes, very important. We're going to be right back on The Simple Truth with Monsignor Charles Pope talking about the Ten Commandments today. And we'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. If you're looking to make the most out of what you can donate to Catholic Radio, making a transfer of stock is a great opportunity for your giving to go even further in support of the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Please consider this option in helping us spread the gospel message over the airwaves and through mobile devices. Many people donate to charities by gifting stock. There are even substantial tax benefits for donating stock to a charity such as ours. Would you like to learn more about the possibility of gifting stock to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network? Please call us at 1-877-888-6279. That's 1-877-888-6279. 6279. You can also visit us online at thestationofthecross.com. That's thestationofthecross.com. Thank you for your support of Catholic Radio. May God bless you and your family. And what will happen on the day of judgment when God says, I gave you wealth, I gave you your health, I put you in a mission field. You did nothing. You neglected the suffering and the poor. They were literally right down the highway from you. 
And when he asks, why did you use all those blessings only for your own comfort and ease? Sermons for Everyday Living, weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. Are you ready to take on the world of flesh and the devil with just the facts? This is Jesse Romero, host of Jesus 911, heard weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm joined each day by a variety of co-hosts like Ruben Nadam, Paul Clay, Dan Schneider, and my amazing wife, Anita Romero. We tackle Catholic devotions, spiritual warfare, family life, saving America, and everything in between. Join us each weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Jesus 911. God bless you. Keep the faith. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. We are talking about living the Ten Commandments today, and our guest is Monsignor Charles Pope, who wrote a great book on it, The Ten Commandments, published in 2014 by Tan, tanbooks.com. For more on the good work of Monsignor Charles Pope, go to his website, msgrpope.com, monsignorpope.com. Um, Monsignor, we, we left off with you sharing a little bit on atheism, helping us to, to make sure that we understand that under the first commandment. Anything further you want to say on that? I know the break kind of interrupted there, or uh, do you want to move into the second commandment? Um, the floor is yours. Well, maybe just to uh, repeat the one thing, which is that we have a, um, you know, this rise of militant atheism. You know, I, I kind of remember as a kid, way back in the 60s and 70s, you know, that if there were atheists around, they weren't as numerous, but they were kind of like, well, like, hey, man, you know, I'm not into God, like, but if that floats your boat, go ahead, man, um, things like that. Or they would ask questions like, how can there be a God that you talk about if there's evil? They might they might do that. But what we have today is, like I say, a very militant and rising form of a militant atheism that seeks to not just... Uh, look, let's live and let live, um, but rather he wants to eliminate eliminate the the, the Christian vision from uh, from our world. So just be aware of it, um, and uh, it's it's taken hold of a lot of places who see, who see the faith as as either foolish and stupid, but more importantly, who often see the faith as dangerous to their to their mission of trying to secularize the whole world. Yeah, very important for uh, for parents to understand and certainly to be helping their children um, understand how this is going on in the world today. Um, as we get into the second commandment here, uh, which is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, you break this open in your book under uh, three headings, and these are the distinctions here. Very important, cursing and blasphemy. Also, the wider meaning of vain and the swearing of oaths. Uh, go ahead and break this open for us, Monsignor. Yeah, I, I think the, um, just as background, let's remember that in our modern world, we're very informal about things. Um, and um, I, I think certainly to a fault. Um, we, we, we never think twice about being asked to give our first name. That wasn't always true. In fact, I even meet a few older people that say, well, what's your first, what's your first name? You're expecting to say John or Mary, and they say, I'm Mr. Smith. And you're like, okay, and we'll stop you here. Um, but as I say, we do have the thing in our culture still that children are expected to refer to their parents um, or to elders by their last name or, you know, with teachers and um, with titles like mother or father. But um, that's about all that's left, you know. With the sharing of a name... In ancient culture was very um, very important and it, it indicated intimacy uh, it indicated that there's a relationship of trust um, you didn't just share your name with anybody you didn't just eat with anybody you know these things were signs of intimacy and love and trust and of family so that's the first thing maybe just by way of background so in effect the fact that God shares his name when Moses asked it is really an astonishing gift and it says, it indicates intimacy. And so with that in mind, um, to simply pitch God's name around, you know, uh, in, in a vain sort of a way, or to use it for wrongful purposes like cursing and so on, is a grave offense against this beautiful gift that God shares his name with us. So let's, uh, the first one, I think the most 
obvious reading that most people have of this commandment is we shouldn't, you know, curse or, 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 or you know, in some way blaspheme God's name. Sometimes um, people call this swearing, but it's not, it's, it's not exactly what, um, you know, what the, what the mind, but, you know, when we say, you know, oh, GD or, you know, JC, you know, that type of, um, that type of rough language or you know when we say you know uh you know uh, you know god damn you or something uh, we we're, we're calling on god's name to not bring a blessing but to indicate a curse you see so <clears throat> it's one thing to just sort of throw the the name of god around sort of lightly uh, but then to actually but to actually use it for a curse well now that's that's a far graver matter um and um it's a grave misuse of god's name uh, first of all, God alone is the judge um, of all things. But um, at the end of the day, we, we God wants his name for us to be as a blessing and not to be something that we would use to curse or seek to curse somebody with. So that's the one area, cursing and and, um, and blasphemy is it, we hardly, you know, uh, well, again, we're just put gratuitously in the movies. Uh, we take the glorious name of God and it's just pitched around to just a, 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 a speak of you know anger or exasperation or shock. Um, even this lighter version that people say, "Oh my God," you know, this type of thing is to be avoided because it, it's just a sort of a throwaway expression, like expressing wonderment or surprise. Um, but that's not. We we don't use God's name as some kind of a throwaway phrase. Um, we um, <clears throat> we want to be careful. To, to oh my goodness or something else, but don't this oh my God stuff needs to go now. Sadly, as I say, those who are who blaspheme the name of God, um, you know, blank your God or you know these kinds of things. Um, this th th this is a terrible, terrible sin against God, and um, uh, it's to take and uh, defame His name and ridicule it. So that's a, that's that's the worst of all the blasphemy, you know. That, that is often meant. Now, just maybe a couple thoughts on the wider meaning of vain. Vain usually means just empty. You know, um, we often think vain means you know you're putting on too cos much cosmetics or too much worried about your appearance. And but at the end of the day, vain basically means empty. Mm -hmm. And so, what we want to avoid are these empty uses of God's name. Mm -hmm. um, the um, uh, like I say, the oh my gods or the you know. Um, Oh, Jesus, you know, that kind of what people just to express a kind of a exasperation. Um, so th that would be the vain use. But here comes, though, the other major import about this. And it's not the one that many people need to go to, but we are not to ever use God's name to uh, swear a false oath. It's a very grave sin. Now, at times, we are asked to enter in to an oath formula, something to the effect, so help me God, or as God is my witness, you know, when we're sworn in in a court proceeding or something. Um, this is permissible, but it, it, we, we don't just, um, uh, we don't just use, do this easily, you know, but what we want to know is when we do it, we better be speaking the truth, because we're saying in a way, and we put our hand on the Bible, if I'm not telling the truth here, may every curse in this book come upon me. If I'm not telling the truth, may God who sees and hears all things punish me accordingly. So, in other words, I'm putting myself before God now, who is the judge of all and who has the possibility to reward and punish. And I am in every way saying, because of this, I'm telling you the truth. Now, for a person to use language like, you know, so help me God, um, would be... Um, um, or to put their hand in the Bible, uh, swear to tell the truth, um, and then not do it. See, that is not just a sin against people who are not hearing the truth. It is to misuse God and God's name as if to say, God can, will give me credibility. He, to, to just use God as a tool uh, to gain credibility, to be under an oath. So we want to be very, very careful um, if you are ever under an oath, or you swear an oath in God's name, you darn well better keep it. And one final thought on that is that there is this, there was a bad habit when I was a kid. I think the expression is less common now, but we were always saying, oh, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God. You know, just throwing that phrase around um, as if to somehow say that, um, 
uh, you know, the, we, we, you know, using a very serious expression like that for little flip matters like, you know, oh, I, I saw I saw the two of them holding hands. I swear to God, you know, you know, that should also be avoided as a vain and empty use of a very important uh, name, first of all, but also uh, to take an oath is a very serious matter. Mm-hmm. Yes, phone lines are open one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. One eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Any question or comment you have for today? But I hope you're getting a sense of what Monsignor was talking about in, in the first segment in terms of these commandments being a gift to us and also being um, a protection to us. These are areas that uh, there's going to be temptations in the world, even to just enter into sort of the flow of what's going on around you in this worldly way. You can pick up some bad habits. You can, before you know it, you can be doing these things and saying, why am I even doing this? You're not even thinking about it. You're just getting into these bad habits. So if so, you want to realize what it is. You want to understand um, the, the good gift of these commandments and you want to really hate the sin, right? You want to really stamp this evil out of your life and ask God's help to do it. That's the beauty of it. He doesn't just throw these commandments on us as a burden. He gives us the commandments and then he gives us the gift of himself. Jesus has come to us. He pours out his grace upon us. Let us call upon him. Let us call upon that grace and then let us seek to live those commandments with him. Um, And it brings to mind something here that is in the examination of conscience in the back of the book under the second commandment. That This never occurred to me before to examine my conscience in this way, but it's part of the positive aspect of this commandment. And, And I think it's terrific. It says this, am I grateful to God for revealing his name so as to build intimacy and trust with me? So just to begin to form yourself in that idea, because it's true, this is reality, and we ought to be extremely grateful to God for revealing his name to us, uh, to build intimacy and trust with us. Um, Monsignor, anything else on the second commandment you'd like to share? No, again, but I appreciate you going back to that idea of the positive aspects of these commandments, which is, is a very beautiful and sacred and holy gift that God shares his name with us. It's astonishing, really. Um, this idea of revealing, especially when you know the cultural norms of that time, which were, <clears throat> you know, you didn't reveal your name except to very close friends and family members. So your first name, that is. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a, a great uh, context to, to understand. Thank you for that. Um, and so the third commandment, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. You write that of all the commandments, it might seem we would get this one right, After all, it commands us to rest one day, the Sabbath, each week, yet many today find this a difficult commandment to observe. Speak to us about this, the third commandment. Yeah, well, you know, at some level, it certainly means that uh, we should get to church and so on on Sunday, but it also means, first and foremost, what you're saying, um, you introduced us to, that we're we're expected to take a, a day and waste it in the sense of just rest, enjoy the fruits of our labors. Uh, as you know, this all is rooted in God's own um, practice. He, he created that what happened on the earth in, in the six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And we who were made in his image are meant to be out there creatively engaged. Um, but but on, the seventh, on the seventh day, we're expected to rest. Now, why is this? Well, you see, because... Well, let's think of the logic of someone who wouldn't want to rest. Well, wait, I, 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 I can make more money if I can work seven days. Uh, I have more customers. I mean, why close down my shop? Um, you know, let's just let's keep it going, keep the money flowing uh, every day. And God says, you see, that's not what your life is about. See? Your life isn't just about money. Your life is about being with your family. Your, your life is about enjoying some of the fruits of your labor. Your life is about taking time to worship me and with your family um, and spend that time and uh, get to know each other, love each other, and uh, and share a common life together. So your life isn't just about work or profit or money. Hmm? And you see, sadly, in this time where we've kind of cast aside this commandment in our culture, and Sunday's just another day, uh, all the stores are open. It wasn't that way when I was a kid. You know, most places were closed on Sunday. But... We start to see that it's really the poor that are required to work the most. 
you know, people who wait tables or people who are engaged in, you know, other types of labors, uh, like running, helping to run stores and so on. And also add to that police, fire departments, emergency room people, that's always been necessary, but we're adding a lot of heavy labors to people and giving them very little rest. And uh, so somewhere God says, your life isn't just about money and work, your life is about me, your family. Talking with Monsignor Charles Pope today on his great book on the Ten Commandments. Tan Books is where to get it, tanbooks.com. Also, it's a great opportunity to call in any question or comment. Maybe you want to bring something up about these first three commandments we're getting into here that we haven't touched on yet. Feel free to do so. 1-877-511-5483. one 511 5483 We'll be right back. The Catholic Current, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. To tinker with the liturgy carelessly, to distort how the body of Christ has matured over time, is really to imperil the truth of the Incarnation. It's to imperil our very salvation. We need to be a lot more careful and a lot more humble. The Catholic Current, 5 p.m. Eastern, from the Station of the Cross and on the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun whose humor, holiness, and years of theological training bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Hello, beloved. This is Mother Miriam, and I am thrilled to welcome you to Mother Miriam Live. As always, you're going to be able to call, text, or email whatever your questions are through a partnership between the Station of the Cross and Live. LifeSite News, you will be able to listen and watch Mother Miriam live on Facebook at the Station of the Cross, including past episodes on podcast. God bless you. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate and our free iCatholic Radio mobile app, or watch the Mother Miriam live video stream on Facebook by searching the Station of the Cross. That's Mother Miriam live each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. Listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit the Station of the Cross.com for more information. The Simple Treat, Jim Havens here with Monsignor Charles Pope, going through some of his book here on the Ten Commandments. How can we live these Ten Commandments better? They are gifts to us. They are protecting walls for us, a shield for us, if you will, by God himself. Uh, but we are made for this glorious freedom of the children of God. And so we want to be running into the, the, the positive aspects that these commandments are proclaiming to us. So we're making sure to hit that certainly as we go, as well as the prohibitions uh, that, that God gives us here that are extremely important to understand also. But as we get into this third commandment some more here, Monsignor Charles Pope, help us to understand this distinction that you lay out in the book. You say that um, we, um, where, where is it here? I guess I just lost it. But you're talking about basically the um, the day for worship and you're making this distinction about how um, some say, well, sure, it's, a day, it's supposed to be a day of rest, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to get together and it doesn't mean we have to go to mass every Sunday or anything like that. But you say, hold on now, that, that is included in there. Can you help us to understand that? Yeah, in the book of Leviticus, which helps to specify this command just a bit, we um, we see that, um, well, for example, um, it spells this commandment out. It says this, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh is a, sa- is a day of Sabbath, of solemn rest, and holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. So notice that holy con- convocation or holy gathering. That's that's the, for them, in their little towns that that you know would be like the synagogue service but certainly in the temple uh worship was to be conducted there so um there there were rituals and and worship 
that were expected to be carried out. Now, these tended to not be extremely lengthy, um, but they were nevertheless an essential element of the day, of the seventh day, the day of rest. We don't just rest at home, we rest in the Lord. And we, we give him thanks for the benefits that he's given us the, the capacity to work, the resources with which we can work, and uh, and so on. So these are the, um, the the connection. Now, likewise, in the New Testament, um, it, we're told not you know obviously Jesus it says was in the, he attended the synagogue on the Sabbath habitually, Luke four and verse sixteen. In other words, he was in the synagogue that Saturday as he was in the habit of doing. So the the scriptures make it clear that Jesus fulfilled. This aspect of the Sabbath, you know, he was in he was in the synagogue in the morning. Now, yet, yet another thing that we have from the book of Hebrews is that it says that uh, Scripture admonishes us that we must quote not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but we should gather and encourage one another. So, again, as the Scriptures teach us again that this meeting together is an essential part. Uh, our in a way, our church family is an extension of our of our own family of origin. And uh, it's part of, we're, we're, we're knit together in a holy community. And so once again, we're summoned to this commandment to keep keep a day of rest, that is to say no, no uh, ordinary work, but also to keep a day of worship. Sadly today, as you know, many do not go to church anymore. Only about 20 to 22% of Catholics go to mass. Now that was before the plague. I think that number's even lower now. And I don't know that we'll ever get all the folks back that were there before. When I was a kid, you know, over 80% of people went to Mass, went to some church service. If they were Protestants, it was just a thing. You know, you just, you went, decent people go to church, and we're decent people, so we go to church. It may have been a cultural thing, but it was about to go away. And sadly, church attendance has just plummeted in our in our lifetime, um, as I say. It was not always this way, and um, it's, it's very problematic. First of all, God is worthy of praise. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about worship. He doesn't put it where you might think, under, say, faith or, or maybe love. He puts it under justice. We owe God gratitude. We owe him thanks. We owe these in worship. We owe these things to God. They are due to him, see? And it's not that he's got a big ego. But we need to practice gratitude. We need to practice graciousness. And we've got to just get over this idea that, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Well, it's not about you. It's about God and the praise and thanks and the glory and the worship that he is due. Because he's God. And he's the author of every blessing you have. You would have nothing at all. You wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him. So this is uh, a, a, it's also a very grave problem today. People are not being formed. They're not grateful. Uh, they, they, they're not quick to remember that all, every good and perfect gift that they have comes from above, from God the Father. And this leads them to a rather um, what's-in-it-for-me mentality, a rather selfish, narcissistic tendencies. So with all that in mind, I think the third commandment has a lot of important things uh, to teach us and remedies to provide for us so that we don't just become so selfish and uh, self-centered. Yes. Yeah. Any any specific encouragement that you might have for um, husbands and fathers, or exhortation for us, including maybe some admonishment as needed here on living Sunday well. How can we advance? What what, what can husbands and fathers do? Um, what is the right mentality that they ought to have in going about uh, fulfilling their role as husband and father on Sunday? Yeah, well, I actually start by being the first one up on Sunday morning and getting your kids up and saying, come on, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And, um, you know, it's nice that the wife can help, but the point is that, you know, she shouldn't, too often, wives seem to more often have to drag their husband to church. And that is completely backward. The husband is expected to be a spiritual leader in his home, and he's expected to be the first one up and the first one to show the way. And obviously the mother has an important role. But a father should be reading Bible stories to their children. Fathers should be teaching their children right and wrong and insisting on it. So these are things that are often left to the women. Sadly, it's a long thing going back centuries in many of our cultures in the West 
that you know women and children go to church but men men don't go to church and that's, that's a sin first of all but secondly I said by the way it's a moral sin you know the church speaks of uh, of this uh, missing mass on, on Sunday without a grave reason it calls it a grave sin you know and um, so we, we, we want to see that uh, first of all it's a sin but it's also a lack of leadership um, for men who should be the first one up leading their family to God and uh, so we'll, we'll see here that um, um, this has to be again something that we find we find this in every sociological study in the last 20 or 30 years that it's it's really the faith of the father that's essential in, in, in making as, as best sure we can that if the children will continue to practice the faith. Sadly, if the dad's not going to church, it's very much more unlikely that the children will, will practice the faith as they get older. And um, But when, when the father is, there's a much higher likelihood. Now, this may sound like, well, you know, that sounds sexist. Well, I don't, I don't know what it sounds like, but it's just what the data shows. And um, the father's role in the faith is critical, critical. And children pick up right away. If daddy's not going to church, you know, this isn't to be taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the book, again, is The Ten Commandments. You can get it at tanbooks.com. It is worth it not only for the breaking open of the commandments, but for that examination of conscience in the back. We're going to have Monsignor Pope go through commandments 4 through 10 with us next Monday. Um, but for now, anything to offer by way of conclusion for us today, Monsignor Pope? Well, again, just kind of just to end where we began, these commandments are trying to paint a picture for us of the transformed human person and to in every way be able to assist us in coming to that fullness of life that God wants to offer us. So if they're not for us, they're not against us, they're for us. And they're not prison walls, they're defending walls. And so we should rejoice in them and the freedom that they ultimately offer us. Absolutely. Can you close us out with a final blessing? And may the peace and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. And again, the book is The Ten Commandments. You can get it between now and next Monday's show. Read through it. It's a short book, but very, very powerful. Again, tanbooks.com, tanbooks.com. Thank you very much, Monsignor Pope, for being with us today. Thank you. All right, and God bless you out there in the audience. Hope you're having a great day. Advent and that that will continue all the way to a very blessed Christmas coming up quick now. Um, so God bless you. Keep going strong in prayer and good work. Um, let's be faithful. God bless you. Hardwood Mall underwrites with the Station of the Cross. When it comes